okay, if the if the blocks were placed somewhere in a period that kind of fits the current timeline, fine. Um, the simple fact of the matter is that whoever worked this rock had something beyond what seems to be the explanation of what was available at that time. Imagine a modern day um, uh, electric powered um, joiner or planer, um, like a hand plane that you would plane the edge of a door. You can buy a Makita version of this and it looks like the old fashioned one that just had a single blade on it. It's got a big flat surface. But the, the electric ones now have a rotary mm -hmm. cutter. So imagine something that might have looked something like that, maybe two flat surfaces and some kind of what looks like an abrasive drum of a sort. And then you hand advance it across a semi-finished surface. This mark, this rectangular shape, reminds me of the modern um, circular soul marks. That's what I'm saying. So before the Serapium, we were talking about these um, polishing techniques, and you mentioned one of these, which is also present here in the, actually it's kind of a, I don't know, 50 centimeters deep layer, which is shoveled, not, not shoveled, but shaved off from this huge granite block. Yeah, scooped. Scoop. <laughs> is it scooped? Yeah, these, the, the ones that you're sitting on, this area, the casing stones, the granite casing stones of, of that particular. It's the smaller uh, the smaller pyramid. The pyramid. Um, but it's only present in the, around the entrance. Yes. So. It's like that's where they started to, to create the finished surface. And they were working away, looked like they, were, they started at the actual, this is another scene on the this is the 90 degrees from that. Other, I think it's the other yeah. side of the pyramid. The other, this is this is on the it's supposed to be the mortuary temple's entrance or something like so that. So this would be the side of the of this pyramid that's ninety degrees from the entrance, mm -hmm. uh, ninety degrees clockwise. Yeah. So the and the um, and the, um, what did you call it? The temple, the mortuary temple. Mortuary temple. It's uh, right. Was built right up to it. In front of it, yeah. yeah. And the scan pyramid guys just found something there because there was a, a no, I think this part was luminescence dated. They, they not the scan pyramid guys, but the other research team, I don't know when, probably a long time ago, they tried to luminescence date the, the casing. Mm -hmm. And it came back around the time of the mainstream timeline. So it was kind of accurate, probably a couple hundred years before. But it was close to that mainstream um, time when they built the Kafri, uh, when they built the Menkaure pyramid. Mm -hmm. But there was another. I think they they kind of dug something in or in between the the blocks. It was kind of a probe or something. I don't know. I'm so curious what they're testing or what's what. How could you even start? I mean, they are. I I know that they are using the muon radars. The cosmic particle detectors to find new voids and new passageways in the pyramids, but how would you start look around? <coughs> Goodness, bless you, around the pyramid, because definitely there are some interesting parts mm -hmm. outside, mm -hmm. around the mortuary temples and the causeway, etc. <clears throat> well, I think you know, kind of coming back to. Uh, what you just said about some some method of dating um, their sample or whatever they did right there. Um, fine. It's luminescence dating. So basically it's telling that when this rock was exposed to sun the last time, kind of. Okay. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. So they 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 got into a concealed or dark spot and removed yeah. a sample of material to then test to see what its a charge of the crystal charge yeah, of the crystals was, and then tried to tried to date it based on that. Fine. Um, I, I think that's fine. I I when I when I think or look of look at. <clears throat> That what seems to be evident, even in this slide here, of the finished surface relative to the either side of what looks like the finished surface, we still see evidence of some kind of removal tool um, in terms of its kind of scoopy sweep mark uh, tool witness. Mm -hmm. So... Okay, if the if the blocks were placed somewhere in a period that kind of fits the current timeline, fine. Um, the simple fact of the matter is that whoever worked this rock had something beyond what seems to be the explanation of what was available at that time. It's, you still think that it's kind of a... Uh drum rolling grinder power tool or something like that yeah that it it just it, it like, kind of has that look you know <clears throat> who who's to say without being the witness there and watching it but who's to say exactly what that was but it it has two things one it has kind of this sweep out radius look it looks like it was done in multiple passes kind of like a paint roller um You, you see what looks like multiple passes, and it looks like where these passes end in a lot of cases is, is freehand. It's not necessarily being run on a track or something like that, or coming to a dead stop in some places. Like what we saw on that corner of those two walls coming together with the small radius looked like that radius was pretty even all the way up. So there was definitely more of an intention to create that line with whatever they were doing. Here, the intention is to create a flat surface, the final, the finished surface of this casing stone. And they started working their way away from the start point, wherever that, maybe that was in the center of right, what we're looking at right now. And they started working either direction. And you can see the passes that they were taking. And the same is also there with, I think this is the cuff ray pyramid, the middle one. You know, this, uh, I think it was the first blocks, but still the casing. I don't know what it's called. It was a corner block. It was on the floor, but still part of the already removed casing. Yeah, Or I think, that, it, uh, I think that video was to show that the surface of that is really pointing at the surface that's all the way up at the top. Yeah, exactly. So you have to keep this this line and you have a quite low tolerance in this height. Mm -hmm. Because if you just deviate one millimeter in the bottom, probably you have half meter or more on the top. Well, I once exactly. again, I mean, whether, whether you have... Um, a, a path-guided tool that then replicates that guided um, movement onto the surface of the stone, you know, like a milling machine would use its way to then uh, create the tool path on the work. Whether you have that here or not, I don't know that that's definitive one way or the other. Um, but what you do have is some means of gauging it. You got to do something. So the tool, either the tool is going to be run across there um, and either hand guided or rudimentary guiding of the tool across the surface uh, while it's being checked or it's checked immediately after that. If The, the, the appearance of is whatever this thing is, its ability to remove granite at a reasonable depth. Um, you can see these knobs. Yeah, I mean, 
the appearance of, of one pass to remove what looks like six inches deep and or more of granite at a time, it me, you know, it looks to me as if if you had to go back and make a correction pass just to clean it up, you could do that fairly easily. Once it was gauged, it's like, no, a little more here. And you just keep doing that as you work your way up. Once again, whether you're going to get a truly flat plane all the way to the top of the pyramid there, I don't know that that was as critical as it appearing to be flat over a certain distance. And maybe that distance was two or three stones, mm -hmm. two or three courses high, that it had to be perfectly flat there. But every two or three, every time you move up a stone, that changes slightly, and it might do a little of this as it goes up. We don't know because it's... I think it's averaging out. They never finished it. And two, it's not there anymore. Um, but, but I think, once again, if, if you... If you look at the evidence where whatever this tool was that has this curve on it, where it stops, it stops in kind of uneven places, which argues in the direction that this was a hand advanced tool of some sort or a rudimentary, rudimentary guided tool of some sort that didn't have any fixed stops or anything like that. Why they would stop there. Why, they Why would they stop right here before the next level? I mean, it's for me, it seems like they started to use it from left to right and not from up or from down to up. No, no, no. It looks, yeah, and I would agree with that, that the passes are horizontal. They moved it horizontally <clears throat> and they didn't even touch this no. upper level. They didn't need to. I mean, that's, that's a natural break point that you wouldn't have to work against. Um, and that would be, once again, these people were most likely human and had human traits of, of I don't want to say laziness, but, you know, you're going to you're going to work the tool as easily as you can and maintain as much control as you can. Because you're trying to produce a relatively precision surface for something this big. You want to maintain a lot of control. So why fight trying to do certain features like yeah. cut part way into a stone? Why not just make sense, yeah. move along? Now, I don't know that the tool was as wide as these courses of stones. They may have taken a couple passes per stone, but it would be very easy. And even here, you can see that little high point mm, down. Which one? That one right there. You see that little high point? Well, it looks like two different passes for the tool going horizontally. There's the thing, like right here, this was a pass going this way. And then they moved up here into the pass and stopped short of this surface. Uh -huh. So they used here and yeah. then go with another path. They probably there. did this one first and then this one second. Yeah. So instead of crashing into this one, they just stopped a little short. And then they went onto this one and they went further because they've got this natural seam in this place, right? So the overhang of this probably looked kind of like that. And they just went along until they got past this and past that seam. So they weren't stopping right on that seam. They didn't get into the finished surface on this one, but, they, but the radius of the tool is apparent on that. So they tried to kind of stop on that line. This one, they stopped on this line just a little bit past it. And it looks like this course didn't have a... The top one, right? It was probably. like a straight cut this this is probably from mm -hmm. from the quarry be my guess so, so they these quarried blocks, these blocks so were shaped them together mm -hmm. yeah and this was the fit surface that was created at the quarry or maybe um you know it's really hard to say exactly how they did this one of these two surfaces the bottom or the top was probably created flat at the quarry and the two sides were created flat they put the block in place maybe they then came along and leveled all of the blocks to put the next course of blocks in place. Hmm. Yeah. But the, so if you, if you had blocks, you wouldn't have to necessarily worry about the, the, the overall thickness or height of the blocks. You just had to have one side that was good and two edges, put it in place, run a, run a course, take your, 
granite mower and mow the top. Granite mower. <laughs> so now it's all flat, and now your next course goes in place. It's quite similar to these in Peru, actually. I mean, it just reminds me of this one. Yeah, I love, I love looking at this kind of stuff for how, how do the lines of gravity move through these, all of these? Because I think there's, there's definitely a pattern to be noticed there. Now, um, a particular pattern of how they placed each one of these stones, which went down first, which went down after. Uh, angles, there's certain places where you see kind of keystones that were probably the last one that got put in place. Yeah. Um, like especially, like yeah, like that one there. Um, especially if they were, in fact, using some kind of chemical mud compound to, to slightly melt the surfaces together, and they were using gravity to, um, to, force, to force their fits. Here are the stones of the link. There it comes. <laughs> yeah, you see most of the vertical fits don't seem to have as much variation as the ones that have horizontal fits. And the horizontal fits would be more, much more greatly affected by the use of gravity to fit them. Hmm. Right? So if you were melting these things with some chemical you'd have much more of that action on the horizontal lines than you would on the vertical yeah. lines. Um, you would think, that's what, that's what I would That's think. a <clears throat> very deep rabbit hole. But here is your favorite stone from one of, my one of my favorite stones. But here's a good, here's a good spot right here. There's a, there's a bit of a, um, a ledge right here that's kind of coming up this way. The, on this plane, the lines are coming straight. But on this plane where this ledge is, you can kind of see them following, and it follows that ledge. So you were telling here that it's probably a drum roll grinder handheld? Yeah, imagine a modern day um, uh, electric powered um, joiner or planer, um, like a hand plane that you would plane the edge of a door. You can buy a Makita version of this, and it looks like the old-fashioned one that just had a single blade on it. It's got a big flat surface. But the, the electric ones now have a rotary mm -hmm. cutter. So imagine something that might have looked something like that, maybe two flat surfaces and some kind of what looks like an abrasive drum of a sort. And then you hand advance it across a semi-finished surface, somewhat flat, like you can kind of see to the, well, the outside of this one's not as flat as I would have expected, but nonetheless, you run it across and it's once again hand-guided. Um, some, some people's first thought was the edge that you see to the left of the photo looks like a big radius. But in fact, yeah, that, yeah that, but in fact, it's not a true radius. It's like just a handmade line. It's a handmade line. And the reason I say that is because if you move over one, and you can actually see, yeah, stop there. Here you can actually see um, one plane that goes over and then there's a ridge to the right. If you move over to the right, right there, there's that ridge. And then there's the next cut. Now, which one happened first? I couldn't tell you. But there are two. I just start to record because then it will be hard to to remember your what you're pointing at. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so if you if you look closely at at like this area right here, you see these striations or lines that move oh, uh, from from afar to close to us. Follows this ridge line here between the two different the two different passes of this cutter. We see that the the edge of this pass radiuses up just a little bit. And it seems to be about the same radius as you see over here where it radiuses up to the edge, the end. So that's the the this whatever this cutter was um, had a slight radius on each side of it, which would definitely be an advantage for blending one pass to another without just a crisp edge. Hmm. It's much easier to get blend lines that way by having a radius. We do this sometimes on belt sanders. 
Um, so you, if you look closely, you see the actual, um, what look like, if, if you ran a paint, if you ran a paintbrush down here with fresh paint, when the paint first went down, you'd see these little grooves left by the hairs of the paintbrush. It looked kind of like that. But I'm not saying that's how this was done. I'm just saying that's, that's a good way to think of what these things look like. This was probably left by some kind of abrasive drum that was spinning. Like I said, that had a little bit of a, uh, a barrel shape out here and probably one on this side, but we can't see it because the surface drops to this level here. Do you need to hold a consistent uh, revolution per minute for this kind of pattern? Or is it feasible if some guys are, I don't know, turning a bike or something which transfer this movement and they used it for the grinding? Um, one would expect that the faster you ran, if this in fact was a drum, the faster you could turn that, the more even the, the lines would be. They wouldn't kind of like wobble around or go in and out a little bit. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't jump or whatever. So a little more speed would be better than less. This could very easily be something as simple as an abrasive belt going over a drum that's in this orientation. And so the belt was big and it could have been spun from above or, I mean, all I'm saying is that what it appears to be is kind of drum shaped where it hits the, the work surface and it leaves scratch marks that go in the direction that you're pushing the tool. And that's what we see here. These scratch marks or grooves or whatever they look like, paintbrush we marks. We have a much better video or recording of that here. I think, yes. Yeah, you can kind of, I think the orientation of this, um, you can kind of, whoa, you can kind of see them here. Yeah. I'll turn this around and that's why. I see them going this way. Anyway, back to that, that other, the other spot where we were. What I'm trying to say is that, was that back or forward? Can you find it? It was another video. Oh, no, yeah. oh, okay. All right, so let's stop there for a second, once again. Um, this pass right here is a little deeper than this one. Doesn't seem to be deeper than the one next to it, but it looks like it was, they'd already taken one pass here and then maybe they did this, but they realized that this one was too high or something. So they came back and took another whack at it. And the second time they didn't start all the way at the end and they didn't finish all the way at the other end. And you can see where the tool comes down and, and begins to hit uh, the, the stone about here and then moves across here and then begins to pull out somewhere right around here. Because you don't see this yeah. dent here anymore. It kind of is starting to pull out about the time that this line starts to disappear. The other thing that you see is that these, these lines that appear to be fairly straight, these lines come along here and then they turn a little bit. You can't see it because this one's blurry. Maybe the video has it. Really? It's turning? You have to get, you have to get up at it as opposed to being so close to the surface to actually see. Yeah. I probably have a photograph that you can see that from. So he's saying that these striations on the right side of this ridge here, yeah. they're turning this way. They start turning, yeah. Not, not that tight of an arc that you but just did. But slightly. Turn slightly, yeah. There was a spot maybe further down where it kind of appears. We will find it. Picture. <clears throat> yeah, I have tons of videos and it was, I didn't, I still didn't have time to select the best ones. Oh, shoot. Too many buttons 
thoughts on this thing. <laughs> you, you can kind of see it here. So this line, this is one single pass that went from the, that end all the way to the other end. But here you can see where the tool landed somewhere right in this area, swept through here, and came down and started to come out right around here. And as it was coming out, it started heading a little bit to this direction. And that's implicating that they pulled it out and they Yeah, they they yeah, they turned. Did, they turned slightly as they pulled it out. And that was, you know, when I walked up to this thing, I don't know if you watched me when I first walked up to this and I just started shaking my head. It's <laughs> like it's obvious. It's just obvious that this was a this was a hand advanced tool. It was about this wide. They took multiple passes at it. This one pass, they came down. They didn't follow the line of the other one exactly accurate, and you can see where it curves a little bit and, and sweeps. They tried to blend that pass as best they could, so they they came in, and it was kind of a blend uh, 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 trajectory, got the material off, and then tried to come off in a blend trajectory before they hit the end. And you can see the evidence. The, uh, the line pattern is absolutely there to see that. And there's a couple of other ones that quite, aren't quite as obvious as that one as you go all the way across this thing. But you see it all the way across. So it couldn't be a circuit or so. This was not done with a circuit or so. I was wondering, is it... This is, this is actually the only stone that I've seen this exact pattern on. This was the only stone I saw this exact pattern on. I didn't, and I kept, because this was one of the early ones that we saw this, I think it was day two maybe. Um, and I kept looking to find this one. This is, this is a particular pattern of a, what looks like a particular finishing, semi-finish to finishing tool. I kept looking for more evidence of this tool and I didn't really find it. This stone or slab, can we call it slab? Slab, yeah. It was standing on four rocks, like on a pedestal or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like someone had placed it there. Placed it there, yeah. And I was wondering, is it possible that it's a it's a modern cut? Someone That's, just it's totally possible. Someone just did it and put it there and now we are But you kind know, of, how, how long has this been sitting there? There's a good question. You know, how long do people have some kind of pictorial record of this being in this site? And once again, this is a special access site, but it's also a site where they filmed that movie. So this this site was accessed. Which movie? Um, ah, the the Pharaoh Land of Pharaohs or Land something of like that. Or something like that. The one where they it was basically about them preparing the the temple for the Pharaoh to be buried and all that stuff. So, so it could the, couldn't be a kind of a leftover from that. I mean, why would you do it from granite for a movie? Obviously, that, that's, well, that's, that's not needed, not necessary. Well, I'm saying that, that, that this site has been accessed, uh, probably without a whole lot of control. Um, but I don't know if a tool existed prior to about 1970 or sometime in the 60s that could have, done, could have left this witness. I think once once we got to the point where we could affix diamonds to metal and and create when was that? It was a 1900s. Well, so. I remember from a from a industry accessible standpoint, these things started to appear in the early 70s. Really? Mm -hmm. And that would be diamonds that were fixed to steel plates with silver solder or something like that. Probably very primitive versions of not embedded in the into the metal, just fixed somehow. Yeah, like glued to the surface, mm -hmm. but glued with metal, soft yeah. metal. Um, they they were making um, lapping tools out of them. This is what we used to sharpen our tool bits with. Um, now, this is another great. <laughs> I miss this one. 
that was the point where I was lost in the Cairo. It was in the it was in the Cairo Museum, right? Oh, you missed this all again. Oh, yes, I, really I, mean, I missed the entire group, and I okay, I was wandering. I seen a lot of statues, vases, reed bows, etc. But yeah, and I was I was looking for you, but I was kind of kind of fixed on this one. I I want to hear your opinion about this because I missed it. Yeah. This one has the appearance of a circular saw and kind of in the in the way that a carpenter would use a skill saw on a piece of wood that was too big for the saw so the saw didn't get all the way across the wood it's unfortunate that the um, the box itself is lying on its side because it it kind of changes the point of reference to think about how this was done. So you just have to kind of let go of that and say, chances are this box was originally started by scooping out the interior. Enough was left on the bottom to make a cut and remove a lid from the bottom to then become top. So the inside was scooped out to a rough finish and then it was flipped over and they started to remove a layer of the bottom that would become the lid, the top portion of which had been shaped with a couple of big facets that ran the length of it. So you have that kind of like gabled sides to the, to the lid. And then they had what looked like a, a sizable circular saw. I, although I'm not convinced it was circular, but there's evidence that that kind of says it was. Talk about that in a second. Um, but it wasn't big enough to cut entirely across the width of the box in a lengthwise direction. So what they did is they cut to center or just past center by coming in from the sides in multiple passes in other words, starting at one end and moving in to as far as they could and then coming out and then moving over and moving in, maybe doing a little bit of sideways action and then coming out and going in. And then they did the same thing from the other side. That's what we can see here. Yeah. Let's see the two. But only from one dimension, from, from one So this plane. is where you see at the, at the third passes, they were they were trying to meet in the middle, and oh, you're you know, talking about this twenty second slide. Yeah, um, you can see here where you you've got a pass that looks like it's coming from one direction, which is coming up to the bottom. The, the little bottom triangle there is the the radius of the tool is coming in from this direction, and then the top one, the radius of the tool is coming in from this direction. And the center would be way off to the right side of the of the photograph. This was not the top part was not coming from this way. No, just coming from. from it's the top. coming in like this, but that was clear off to the like if this was the cutter. Give me that. That spinning thing. <laughs> if this was the cutter, the center of it was over here somewhere, and what you're seeing is approximately this area of the cutter in the in the picture, mm -hmm. and the same thing with this one. Mm -hmm. It's approximately right here. And they didn't meet at the same angle or the same no. point. And, and, and then either the what they were trying to remove as the portion of as, as this far along on the lid either broke off or they got stopped and somehow they never finished it. And then somewhere along the way, history, somehow that piece broke off. Maybe somebody salvaged it because they saw it was already cut this far. They broke it off so they could use it for something else. But it, it was, you know, you can see it's been broken and it removes the evidence of this rough working to get that slab off the end of the, the bottom of the box. The saw, the saw marks mm -hmm. over on the side slide there don't meet up exactly. They're fairly close, but they don't meet exactly which meant that this was probably a hand advanced tool of some sort. Um, fairly well guided to try and meet in the center, but they didn't quite get there. That's probably as good as they could do. But this was not the circular one. 
This one looks to me to be circular. Also. Yes. But, but hand guided. But it's all hand guided yeah. because like I said, they came in they came in from one side and out. They might have moved a little bit like this. Maybe they moved in like this. And then they moved over and did kind of the same thing. And then they moved over a third time and did kind of the same thing. But this time, that's this is where we see the break of the top where the piece is broken off. There's three passes because you can feel three separate planes. Mm -hmm. They don't, they kind of meet, they blend nicely, but you can feel the difference in the planes as you run your hand across it. And the same as apparent on this side, they came in and did kind of the same thing from this side. And the reason why I'm saying they moved a little bit like this, possibly, is because when you when you look at the the lines, the witness of what seems to be an abrasive tool of some sort, they tend to run lengthwise with the box, generally. Now, I didn't get a chance to map every square inch of that to see that they were all running in parallel lines or there was some, some curvature that would more so indicate a round disc-shaped tool of some sort. And this is where I kind of got stuck. It's like I'm not seeing as much sweep in and sweep out and the motion of this swept in and swept out as I would expect to see. But when you get to the last cut from both sides that still has material sitting above it, the line that you see is circular. So Could this have been done with a, a drag saw um, that had an arc on it? Possibly. Could it have been done with a drag saw with loose abrasive? Kind of struggling with that a little bit because of the look of the scratches. I can show you how it looks like when they're making something with loose abrasive. So they are trying to cut these relatively tiny slab. They, they're putting some kind of blockade yeah, damn. Damn on both sides and using this drag saw made out of copper. Or drag bar, it's not even a saw. Mm -hmm. And after, I don't know, many hours, probably a lot, they finally cut it through. They're using the same sand and water method for the abrasive. it's done I'm trying to yeah here we go mm -hmm. to be honest I see less consistency and homogeneity is it homogeneity mm -hmm. I see less consistency and homogeneity here than on the sides where we have seen those striations. So this is not that nice, what we have seen. Yeah, it's um, seemingly much more random in terms of the consistency of uh, notable lines. Yeah. Um, the lines seem to be shorter when they end, so that you see lines and they seem to be spaced, but not bad appearance but quite but each, randomly but each line seems to be fairly short and then there's another one that takes its place which would kind of make sense with loose free free sand abrasive but like i said i i would like i would tend to want to try and take and affix an abrasive to this piece of copper or whatever and mm -hmm. then try and use that 
to see how what kind of a witness that would leave. And I think that that's going to leave more of a witness like what we're seeing. And that would be the same thing with even if it was a circular saw that had a fixed abrasive on it. This is the edge. I think they also, yeah, this is the needle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in this where we do see that um, at the point, if we go back to our other slide of the unfinished box, we do see at the base of the witnessable cut, no, not that one, but the, um, the box, there we go, that one. If we look down where the two cuts are meeting, and we look in close there, we do see some tapering of the edge when it finally gets to its outer diameter. There's a little bit of tapering to that. Yeah, in this wall. Yeah, but you also see the squareness of the end of that. I mean, not this one, but here, yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's... Unless they had a means of reflattening the end of the, the copper, you would the, the tendency is for, I think, for a free abrasive and a piece of copper to be drugged through a groove like this. The tendency is for this thing to get get worn in kind of an elliptical shape. The end's gonna get rounded off very quickly. This mark, this rectangular shape reminds me of the modern um Circular so marks. That's what I'm saying. So once again, I still think that whatever this was is abrasive. What the actual abrasive was, I don't know. Um, but it also appears to me that the abrasive was fixed to whatever this blade was, as opposed to free, like just being poured on by sand. Hmm. Um, and, you know, who knows how that works. That, if, if that were the case, and that abrasive, like if it, if, if it in fact were, say, a piece of copper or a piece of steel that they were able to affix diamond to with solder or something like that, those diamond uh, particles would stay in place and the shape of the base metal behind all that would stay in place. It would keep its shape way, way, way longer than a just a piece of copper with some sand. Um, and what we see is at the bottom of these things, like in this case, you can clearly see that that tool has kind of square edges on it. Granted, there's a little bit of tapering as it comes away from the actual very end of the tool. But once again, I would say that if if I was going to design a tool to be used as a, as a drag saw or whatever, and I could affix an abrasive to that tool, I would create a taper at the end of it. So I had a lot of abrasive that could actually do the work of creating that slot. Not just, you couldn't just put abrasive on the very end of it. And, and, expect it, and expect it to do the whole thing. How dense would you embed these diamond or abrasive cores? Because if you don't, if you cannot embed it in a very dense way, you are much slower in the grinding process. Mm. No? Yes and no. You can argue that one both direction. And I think it really has to do with exactly where you are in terms of density. Because you also need to leave somewhere for the yes. cut material to go. So in other words, if you put the abrasive too close together, there's not enough gaps between them, you're very quickly going to fill all the gaps oh, with, yes. with dust. And then the dust is going to prevent the, the, the grains from penetrating the work. So very quickly, you're, in other words, in machining, we call this the tools loading up. It's becoming, it won't cut anymore because there's nowhere for the cut material to go. Based on those striation marks, those, if it was kind of an abrasive, fixed abrasive, they were quite densely embedded in the tool um, because those lines are such, 
they are quite close to each other. Well, once again, um, <clears throat> the lines that I'm seeing on these appear to be more evident that they were produced by a lesser amount of grains than a greater amount of grains. So it appears to me to be more a difference of the size of the grains um, such that you may have a field within a, a covered patch on the tool of where you've applied these grains um, most of it is very consistent in size, and every now and then you have a bigger one. And the bigger one is the one that's leaving scratch because it's higher. Yeah. And the smaller ones are kind of polishing in between the scratches. So, you know, kind of coming back to this box thing and, and looking at, I, I wasn't able to come get, a, get a, a photographic map of that whole kind of cut surface that we're looking at to the right here. So I can't map. I need to be able to map all of those scratch lines to get an idea of what the shape of this tool was. If, it actually, if, if in fact, it actually was spinning like a circular saw or whether it was a, a drag saw that had a radius, somehow it had a radius end or a radius edge or an arced edge because the, the pattern that's left in what you can see right here as it sweeps out seems to be a big radius sweep. And that can only be done with a male tool that's somehow fixed with a radius on it as opposed to let's say a wire like an abrasive wire, because we we use this tool today. The abrasive, the finish that an abrasive wire would leave would also be curved, but it would be curved the other direction. Can't can't create this concave mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, end of the tool finish with a wire. So it's either a disc or it's a part of a disc that's being used as a drag saw. Ah, uh, then. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out the last episode of this four-part series, where we are talking about more than 5,000 years old hardstone bases that could change our current understanding of human history.